Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is David Goodstein, author of Out of Gas, The End of the Age of Oil, and co-author of the recently published Climate Change and the Energy Problem. In this stark assessment of our civilization's dire predicament, uh, David shares his views on the scientific, political, economic and social aspects of the looming global energy crisis. A crisis which has barely begun to unfold, but has already begun to undermine the comfortable, complacent lifestyles which so many of us take for granted. Hello and welcome, David Goodstein, and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm happy to be here. Now, David, we're here today to discuss um, the overall um, energy situation that the entire world is facing, but particularly the industrialized parts of the world that are very much dependent on oil. And the oil situation that we're facing um, was brought to a lot of people's attention back in 2004 when you wrote a small but best-selling book called Out of Gas. And some of the material in there has recently Uh, been presented again in a new book called Climate Change and the Energy Problem, which you've co-authored with Michael and Trilligator. And uh, before we dive into that, um, many people who've listened to this broadcast before will be familiar with um, the concept of peak oil. Uh, But for those who aren't, perhaps you could just sum up the main points of what peak oil actually is. Well, when oil was first discovered in 1859, uh, there was a lot of oil to be found. But uh, as the oil became found, the discoveries slackened off and will eventually reach a peak if it hasn't reached a peak already, after which it will decline forever. That is the the recovery of oil. Um, And the declining rate of recovery of oil, coupled with the uh, increasing demand for oil, will lead to catastrophe worldwide. Now, um, quite a frightening prospect, really. Um, But... It occurs to me that I mean, most of the resources, well, probably all the resources on the earth are not, you know, none of them are finite. Um, there's not much on the earth that really renews itself, certainly not in a, a human time scale. So d- d- is the situation really that we built up um, an almost global industrialized system, society and an economy? We must have known all along that the resource that we were using uh, to do that w- was going to run out eventually. So, I mean, was there just widespread ignorance about this, or did we really underestimate the scale that our oil use would eventually grow to? I think that nobody thought about the the fact that the oil would run out. The people just pretended that the uh, rate of discovery of oil would increase exponentially forever. Uh, Unrealistic though that that might be, they, they made that assumption. So we basically painted ourselves into a major corner with this. That's correct. Uh-huh. Now, some of us are old enough to remember um, the oil crisis in the 1970s and 1973-74, and there was another um, oil crisis in 1979, which I believe was related to Iran. And now the thing about that was the the upset caused by that was really quite significant, and uh, particularly a lot of Americans will remember this, you know, of a certain generation. But two things about those oil crises, of course, is that they were temporary; they didn't last that long, and they were also yeah, they were right. also artificial, uh, in the sense that they weren't caused by a problem sourcing the supply. Now, if it, perhaps you could say something about the problems that were faced at that time, and then. You know how much exponentially worse you know it could be if we uh, if, with the ramifications of the peak oil uh, thesis. Well, at the time, uh, the OPEC missions decreased their production of oil by five percent or so. And that created a crisis in long lines of gas stations in the United States and and uh, crying for our way of life and so on. Uh, the the peak that's coming or has already come, I don't know. Uh, will not be artificial, it will not be temporary, it will be permanent, and uh, that's uh, a major problem. Obviously, the the, the oil crises of the 70s um, sort of came upon us in a relatively short time frame, um, so there wasn't really much preparation that could be done for that such. Um, With the uh, scenario of peak oil, now, we're not looking at like an overnight collapse, we're looking at, you know, our use of oil has been 
gradually increasing you know throughout the 20th and the early part of the 21st century um, once we if we are there's some speculation about exactly where this peak will occur in, in production um, but the other side is going to be a slow grinding step down process as we gradually get used to having less oil and also of course much higher prices yes that's correct um, the the uh, rate at which we can produce oil will decrease uh, the demand for oil will increase and uh, the results will be catastrophic. I, I don't see any way out of that. Uh, so the point I just made about it not being overnight, I mean, is there anything, a lot of commentators have said that we have basically left it too late to do anything meaningful about this. Um, but given that we do, there is still a lot of oil around, I mean, even if the prices are higher and there's a bit more, um, how should we put it, competition or even conflict for what is left, that we you know, we do have time to adjust to this. Do you think we're going to be able to do that in an orderly way? Well, I don't think we're going to do that in an orderly way, although I could be wrong. But um, I think that uh, the lack of our precious oil uh, is something that we don't react to in, in, a, in a nice, linear, suitable way. And um, uh, it's likely to be catastrophic. One thing that's easy to... Uh, uh, forget unless you're uh, steeped in this information is that it's, we're not just talking about oil as fuel here. Uh, if you walk into the average, say, supermarket, um, almost everything you see in your line of sight will have oil either in its production or its transportation, uh, some manufacture, um, all forms of plastic, chemicals, pharmaceuticals. Um, it's not like we can just stop using oil. Uh, find alternate fuel for vehicles, even if one existed. I mean, oil is in, in everything almost. That's right. Uh, oil is the basic ingredient of many petrochemicals that, uh, that 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 inform our entire civilization. So we we must have oil now. We are finding oil in uh, in places that uh, didn't exist before, deep water wells and so on. But that's a sign of desperation more than more more than uh, a solution. Uh, well, speaking of desperation, um, are you familiar with some people in the in the abiotic oil camp? Yes, I've heard of it, and I I, I know uh, what what happened. What happened was that some wells were dug uh, to to find abiotic oil, and they found some oil, but probably the result of the digging itself, and uh, the whole effort went bluey. Mm-hmm. And another issue is uh, we're often the way that, um, I say, particularly in industrialized West, the way our retail um, networks work, I'm thinking specifically here of food distribution. Um, we have lots of just in time um, where stores don't hold a lot of uh, inventory. Difficult to do with fresh food anyway, but basically the old adage goes that um, if food stopped getting delivered um, to you know, urban centers, that we'd have three days before all the stores would be completely empty. And we do have an issue here in that, again, not just a lot of the things that we consume and use, but our entire transportation and distribution network of everything from, you know, essentials like food and water right down to things we would regard as luxuries. But the whole gamut, um, is, again, entirely dependent on oil and oil derivatives. That's correct. Uh, without oil, we can't, deliver, we can't deliver our goods. We can't do anything. Uh, oil is fundamental to our civilization. And it seems that problem not so much in Europe because of the way, you know, how old a lot of the cities are, but uh, in the US, uh, your infrastructure was, you know, so much of it was built up, you know, during the 1950s and 60s. And it was very much geared towards the mindset of that time. So you have sprawling suburbs, um, you know, houses on large plots. Uh, you don't have necessarily um, amenity, day to day amenities um, close to these suburbs. Um, um, involves a lot of commuting into city centres to to work and uh, you know to shop, leisure, retail, all of that. So although there are obviously some changes have occurred in that, and it's not the same across the entire continent, um, America has been very much designed for car use. Yes, um, we we Americans typically drive hundred ton or many ton uh, uh, vehicles to, to work over 100 miles each day and back, and uh, that can't go on, but it does go on up to now. 
what do you think of the uh, the reaction? Um, I'll ask you about America in particular, with you with you being American. Uh, the reaction to contraction of the economy that's occurred since the, the financial crash in two thousand eight, and basically people having to get used to getting by on less. Um, it does seem, certainly from some of the tone that's coming out with the election debates at the moment, that um, many Americans, I don't want to generalise here, but many Americans are, are not dealing with this particularly well and they really would like to get what we would call back to normal as soon as possible. But even if you take the financial crisis out of the equation, uh, the energy situation looks like you know that this, a lot of things about our lifestyles are going away, albeit slowly, but probably permanently. Yes, the, the energy problem has been put off because of the economy. The economy has become the, the number one problem in the United States, but the energy problem uh, exists and will continue to exist and will continue to, to prove uh, uh, most difficult. And, of course, we saw with the reaction to efforts to um, deal with um, CO2 emissions and, and Kyoto, what have you, and the American political response to that, is that it's whatever is being said behind the scenes, uh, ideas of cutting energy use in the name of uh, certainly the greenhouse gas situation doesn't go over terribly well with mainstream America. No, Americans love their gasoline, they love their oil, and they're not going to give it up to, to, to reduce carbon dioxide. Uh, that's a, a great tragedy because carbon dioxide uh, has uh, terrible effects on everything in the United States. Do you think that's what is at the roots of the, I mean, there's no doubt more that affects the, the global climate than just, you know, human activity. Um, we can't deny the influence of the, of the sun, for example, but the global warming, um, the people who deny the extent or importance of anthropomorphic, um, anthropogenic, sorry, global warming, is that rooted basically in a, a desire to not have to face this energy problem? Yes, it is certainly rooted in a desire not to have to face the energy problem, and, and the energy problem is going to bite us in the end. 